Primary changes during this time occur in the details of the brain's local wiring. The brain also undergoes massive amounts of physical changes in its wiring each time we acquire a new skill or ability. Another important physical dimension of change that happens in early life and that continues throughout life is neurogenesis. It seems that really what happens is you're born with some number of neurons and then you make more and more and more and more until you're at least a year old, maybe a little older. And then after that, your brain starts pruning off, maybe not killing off neurons, but killing off little branches of them um, that go off to form connections with other branches. Those connections are called synapses. And then somewhere in there you stop losing and you just have sort of a static number of neurons. But nobody has quite figured out, there's new evidence that shows that you do make some more, but nobody quite knows what the trigger is to make more neurons, nobody knows how it happens. I think it's a hot topic to say the least in neuroscience because if you could figure that out you might have the solution to a lot of diseases um, and possibly to some mental capacities you know that we wish we had. Neurogenesis simply means the production of new neurons in the brain. We know that that process continues into at least uh, early toddlerhood but it had been thought that it stopped again around the age of two or three um, and the reason was almost it wasn't based on empirical observation, it was more just sort of backward reasoning. Namely, the brain is a very complicated computer, and surely if you just sort of haphazardly throw new wires into there, that can't do any good. Therefore, the brain cannot be making new wires, new neurons. Well, it turns out that in an experiment done in the late 90s, which was uh, very clever, they took cancer patients who were terminal and who had of course given their consent to the experiment and they labeled their brain neurons with a particular dye that was incorporated only in dividing cells in other words only in cells that were making more of themselves and this is something that of course cancer cells do all the time after the patients passed away their brains were examined and it turns out that a number of neurons in the brain had taken up this dye and that was prima facie evidence that in fact new neurons were being born in the brain. When we are learning, thinking, feeling, we're also strengthening existing synapses and creating new synapses. A synapse is actually the easiest thing probably to explain in the brain. It's just a connection between two neurons and it's not actually a physical apposition. There's actually a little gap between the two neurons that are connected, and in the space between them is where neurotransmitters float. So you'll have what we'll call a presynaptic neuron, which is going to be the one sending the signal. So an impulse will come down the long axon of that neuron, and at the end of it, it will result in the release of this neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter will float across the gap to what we will call the postsynaptic neuron, which will take up that neurotransmitter, and if there's enough of it, then that neuron too will fire. These synapses connect our neurons one to another, strengthening our brains. One important pioneer who contributed to our understanding of synaptic changes in learning was Donald Hebb, a Canadian psychologist who hypothesized how changes in synaptic strengths could account for learning. It's not the repeated exposure that mattered to Hebb, it's the coincident activities that are generated by any important experience. By the Hebb rule, they're co-strengthened because they co-occur. Donald Hebb's great contribution was to come up with the recognition that neurons that fire together wire together. This was the idea that when you have particular patterns of brain activity over and over and over again, let's say uh, you're a little kid and your mother points out the window and says robin you see the bird you hear the word you have some sense of what this thing is in front of your eyes and then forever after you recognize that that is a robin and that's because the connections in your brain have become stronger the synapses have been created because of repeated exposure to these two things the sound the name of the bird and the image of the bird anyway Hebb's contribution was to make the first baby steps toward showing that our experiences can leave indelible imprints in the brain, in this case stronger synapses, and that's what underlies all of learning. This firing and wiring is the key to learning and plasticity. 
and brain fitness. Whichever synapses are activated together in each moment of time are mutually strengthened. Well, as I practice any simple skill, basically I engage populations of neurons that represent the details of that skill, moment by moment in time. And basically those neurons are engaged more or less simultaneously in time. And one of the tricks the brain has for specifically strengthening its connections, the connections that contribute to, good, uh, to a good effort, to success, is that it strengthens all of those things that happen in the, together in those little moments of time. So that what is activated together in that little moment of time that really matters for the good fry are co-strengthened. And they actually mutually strengthen one another as well as are strengthened simultaneously in time, right? And that's the critical to generating a sort of integrated, cooperative, action of the brain to drive itself towards higher performance and success. And how do we know all of these things are happening inside of our brains? We know it because we can see it. I can put a living individual into a scanner and watch that person's brain function. I can ask that person to count backwards by threes from 100 and see the circuits that are active while they're doing that. How remarkable is that? It's amazing to me that you can actually see the brain functioning while this person performs a task. That has revolutionized our ability to study the human brain. And to me, I think that holds the greatest promise for us to understand all the complexities and all the nuances that make us so human. Because you couldn't do that before. We can actually watch this person in the scanner doing these tasks. That's amazing. Functional MRI is a way of using MRI, but also watching the blood flow in and out of structures. And the kind of functional MRI I like the best, of course, is uh, functional brain imaging. And what happens there is they, they're able to take a picture based on the properties of the blood as it comes in of which areas of the brain are getting more blood at any given time. And that can change. And what scientists are doing is they'll correlate the change with the mental task or the stated emotions or mental state of, the, of a research subject. And then they can see which parts of the brain are more active at the time that the patient is, or subject, is experiencing an emotional state or thinking about something. These important advances in technology have allowed us to see inside the brain. Scientists have repeatedly documented the remarkable capacity for human brains of all ages to change. With that ability lies extraordinary potential for growth and rejuvenation. But this change is not extraordinary. In fact, it is what our brains were designed to do. These are changes that result from the lives we lead and the experiences we have. These are changes that you can induce by learning to play the piano. They are changes that come about when you think new thoughts. So the ways that the brain can change are really opening a lot of eyes in the part on the part of the neuroscience community. Brain change, harnessing the potential for positive plasticity. These are the hallmarks for maximizing the level of your own brain fitness. A clear example of this can be seen in the real-world applications of plasticity, as seen in the rehabilitation therapy of patients who suffered a stroke or traumatic brain injury. The phone rang around 6.20, and I looked at caller ID, and it said Fort Campbell, and I knew, you know. So I just said, John's my son, is he okay? And he said, ma'am, there's been an incident. Well, I remember running up to a Humvee to start unloading it. And uh, all I remember was falling down. And I thought I smacked my head on my rifle. When I got up, I wiped my uh, forehead. And there was a little bit of blood on it. And I guess the mortar round had exploded about five feet away from me. And shrapnel had gone straight through my helmet and then straight through my head. The affected arm had a greater deficit at shoulder and elbow than the fingers, but even the fingers, he had no dexterity, the thumb was extremely weak, and there was almost nothing that he could do with the arm. Edward Taub's therapy that he pioneered at the University of Alabama at Birmingham 
was developed in the service of rehabilitation of brain damage, whether that damage was caused by a traumatic brain injury, like that experienced by John Barnes, or by something like a stroke. If you constrain the good arm so that the patient doesn't rely on it, but instead through intensive therapy, which is about eight hours a day, five days a week for a couple of months or more, but just encourage and coax and urge that patient to use the seemingly paralyzed arm, which sounds paradoxical, but they can. They can make tiny little movements, and if they build on those, they can regain function. Dr. Taub's therapy had similar success with another traumatic brain injury patient, Army veteran Christopher Lynch. It's marvelous working with John and with Chris because they have the discipline of military training. So they approach this as if this were boot camp or basic training. Undertaking the Taub therapy requires commitment on the part of the patient and the caregiver. Recovery does not stop after you get out of the therapy sessions, out of the classroom therapy. You go home and you keep doing it, you keep doing it, you keep motivation. It's the motivation that you need to have. I was a little skeptical. I saw simplistic, repetitious movement in the therapy that he was doing. He had a mitt on his hand. It all made common sense to me, but I wasn't too sure. I, I still had my questions. You know, is this really going to work? Three days into the therapy, Chris woke up in the morning and had had a dream. That was the first surprising thing that I, I felt meant something. He hadn't dreamt in two years. My brain, it felt like the, the brain was firing. It was like the more you, the more you work the brain, the more, the more it, it, it heals itself in a way. On the way home from therapy, um, we were between here and Montgomery, Alabama, and Chris automatically reached up and pushed the button on the radio with his left hand. And it was, um, it blew me away. I looked at him and I was just extremely surprised by it. And he looked at me and said, what? So I knew he didn't actually have to think about pushing the button on the radio. It happened. The main theme of CI therapy, you either use it or you lose it. And if you've already lost it, that's okay. You can get it back if you keep trying. 